Uh, my name is Mikael Tivane. So um, I have a few stories I want to share with you guys here today uh, to talk a little bit about Zendesk, our own experiences with customers and customer success. Uh, talk a little bit about, you know, this new era of different kind of economies that we are, we are in right now. You heard about a bunch of economies right now, and I'm going to talk about the subscription and the convenience and the promoter economy and a lot of other fancy things. And then also I'm going to talk about some basic stuff about managing relationships. Whether customers or personal relationships, it's all the same. So let's get started. Uh, Sendesk, for you, those of you who don't know, uh, Sendesk is a customer service software company. We provide a beautiful product for companies to be able to provide great customer service. We have today, we're a company, today a public company with a little over, what is it, eight, 900 employees. We have, uh, what is it, 11 offices all over the world. We have 52,000 customer accounts on our platform, hundreds of thousands of users, hundreds of millions of end users. And we call ourselves, or we call our mission to bring organizations and their customers uh, closer together. This is the origin of the company. This is five, six years ago, myself and my two co-founders, uh, drinking and smoking, because that's what you do when you have a, a startup. Um, bef <laughs> no? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, this, this is out of Copenhagen, Denmark, thus the accent. Uh, I'm originally Danish, and we moved the company's, uh, company here to San Francisco a little over uh, five years ago. Um, I've recently written this book called Startup Land about our experiences because it's been a crazy ride um, to be able to share with you what it actually means from a few, like, free Danish pale guys coming here to San Francisco and building an enterprise startup because it's been a fantastic ride. Um, we also have a few stories from that book um, that it's more like this is not the book you write to get like top 10 tips for building a startup or anything like that. We just share our story as it is and it's filled with great anecdotes and um, I'm, I hope these anecdotes can be inspirational but this is just our story. There's many different ways of building a startup. This is just our story. You all have to uh, follow your own paths. But I want to share one story from the, uh, from the book, um, a story about how our, our customers have challenged us. Um, because in these growth hacking days, um, it's very easy to start looking at your customers from the perspective of a spreadsheet. This is just a random spreadsheet I, I brought in from one of these growth hacking blocks. Um, where you look at your funnel, you look at all your conversion rates, you look at your ability to um, kind of get the different type parts of the funnel optimized and optimize kind of the lifetime value of the individual customer on kind of all the different products and plans that you have and so on. And I'm pretty sure that all of you have spent time on, on spreadsheets like this. We spend a lot of time on it. Um, and there was a point in time where we basically sat down and said, we can optimize this shit. We can optimize it. We can get a lot more value for our customers. We can get a lot more value for ourselves if we start to move these segments around a little bit, get some of our customers on, on some better plans, get some of them to uh, agree to some different kind of uh, subscription basics. And, and we did that at the same time where we launched a lot of features and we just reached 5,000 customers, which we thought was a big event. And we had this big celebration and we sent out this email in the morning where we told everybody about all these new things and how we changed their plan. And we thought this was just a fantastic day um, with great news for our customers. But of course, what our customers read was we raised the prices. <laughs> Um, and within like six hours from midnight to early morning, suddenly we were on the front page of uh, TechCrunch and our customers were revolting. Um, <laughs> and this was, a, this was a tough day for the company. This was very hard to suddenly have your entire customer base uh, revolting against you. Um, I had so many inbound emails, calls, text messages, tweets, whatever, that I, I simply couldn't deal with all of them. And we had, to, we had to root all this stuff through our own send desk and have the whole team manage all these conversations. 
But it was very much a good reminder to us that in the middle of all these kind of growth hacking uh, things, we forgot about the actual people behind the numbers. We forgot about the customers. We forgot about that these weren't just like numbers in a spreadsheet. These were actual people. So we had to go out on our blog, apologize. Uh, <laughs> um, yes. Um, and really, really own it. Live up to our responsibility as good partners for our customers and, and own the mistakes that we make. Um, we also had t-shirts made. <laughs> There's a lot more. Some of them are, I, I, yeah, I can't even show them here. Um, so we had t-shirts made and we had everybody wear them. We had our board wear them. And in many ways, it became, it became a very transformational experience for the company. Um, it defined us in many ways how we thought about the customer relationship, how we thought about our customers, and, and also basically became very describing for how, what we, what we tried to educate our customers what to do and how to think about their customer relationships. Um, yeah, so if you want to go through this transition yourself, I recommend that you try to raise your prices. It's, it's a very um, educational process. Anyway, um, we, what we experienced, and I, think what, um, and what I think a lot of you guys are experiencing today is that we are at this fantastic intersection of all these different types of economies. We have the subscription economy, we have, and we have the, a, a, a variation of that, which I call the convenience economy, and we have the promoter economy. I think you all heard about the, 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 the subscription economy and how so many businesses are changing their revenue models from being like transactional to being subscription-based. Um, we're using more and more of these products ourselves, everything from Netflix to Amazon Prime to Dropbox to even the Dollar Shave Club for razors. There's so many businesses out there that relies on a subscription-based relationship with their customers. Um, but we also see convenience-based services where we once, or where we initially set up our account with the customer, with, with the company, so they have our, all our account details and we can just use the service on a convenience basis, uh, products like uh, Uber, uh, products like uh, Airbnb, uh, products like Get Around, Munchery here in San Francisco, Postmates, all these services are based on convenience. Because we've set up, we set up our account with them, it's just very easy for us to keep using them. So the similarities between the subscription-based service and the convenience-based services is all about the fact that they have to keep, they, somehow we have to maintain our relationship with these services. We always have to have like a good experience with these services to get back to them. So subscription services, convenience-based services, are all about maintaining the lifetime and the long-term relationship with the customer. It's all about getting the customers back. It's all about having customers for life. Um, there are so many advantages of this model. You all know about that, at least those of you who are in the SaaS business, the recurring revenue, the customer lifetime value. Um, and, um, and for a lot of these businesses, the worst the, the, the enemy is, of course, churn. We also see, we see that intersect with the promoter economy. Like any um, great customer service today, great products today, they provide the basis for great long-term relationships, but where customers have all the power. If I have a great experience with something today, I will go out and I will tell all my friends about it, I will tell the whole internet about it, I will tweet about it. If you have a great experience with it, with this, uh, with my session today, you will hopefully tweet about it and follow me on Twitter. But that's kind of the idea behind the, the promoter economy. By providing people with a great experience, we not only uh, keep, can keep them longer, but we're actually uh, transforming them into, a, um, into an extension of our sales and marketing efforts. Um, the flip side, of course, of the promoter of course, the economy is, of course, the detractor economy. Um, we tried that, uh, as you saw before, like suddenly uh, a bad experience can, uh, 
very quickly spread and um, and um, and uh, influence so many users out there. We saw that when suddenly we hit the front page of TechCrunch by simply by one negative tweet that went completely out of control. Anyways, so we have this intersection between the <clears throat> the subscription convenience and promoter economy. Um, it's a great opportunity for all of us to focus on ongoing relate relationships. Churn, as I said before, it, it, it is our largest threat to this business model. And today, it's very, very easy for business or for customers to take their business elsewhere. Tools, of course, can help, but ultimately, you need to build a business where relationships truly matter, not only for you as a business, but for your employees. And that's one of the hardest things often to uh, build into your culture and build into your company. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about relationships. And these are, these are seven tips for <laughs> building great lasting relationships. You can, um, you can use them in your business and you can use them in your personal life. Anyways, don't overestimate uh, your importance in the customer's life. You are not the center of the universe. You must listen to and consider the other person. Uh, that, same, that is true, too, of your organization. A person is not your customer. Don't use the concept, we have so and so many customers. Um, it is a privilege for you to be in their life, not the other way around. Um, I think we all know this on our own body, that we send out emails to our customers with, like, important account information. And then we realize that none of our customers are reading our emails. <laughs> and that's not because they have a lot of other email that is much more important for them. They just have a life that is much more important for them. They have dinner plans. They have to pick up kids from the school. They have a life. And our emails are just spam. Remember that. Don't overestimate the importance in your customer's life. Also, consider the entire customer experience. Um, <clears throat> organizations, unlike people, they tend to have terrible memories. Uh, the customer that, who buys a product in your store is the same who writes in when that product breaks. These two moments seen from the customer perspective are connected, whereas that's sometimes hard for us as business owners to remember that these two moments are connected. <clears throat> I think it's, I think we all tried this, um, where, for example, if we rent a car online, most of the agencies today, they have great uh, rental websites, so it's very easy to go in and pick up your car, and uh, sorry, to go in and choose your car, your model, and, and your conditions. Very, most of these agencies, very, very elegant experience. But then you go to the counter to pick up your keys when you get to the airport, and suddenly it just becomes a nightmare of complexity. Suddenly they have all these add-ons, suddenly they have all these like special conditions, upgrade opportunities, and you just can't figure out how much does all these things actually cost me? How do I wanna return the car with a full tank or an empty tank? And like, what are all the things, what are all the different options? So it's a really good example of where like two interactions with the exact same company can be completely decoupled in terms of the experience. So consider the entire customer experience. Recognize the right relationship and adapt. Not everyone you meet will be your best friend. Some people are great party guests, some are not. <laughs> the goal is to have the right relationship with each individual. We all know that. We all know tried that in our personal lives. We all tried having that way too chatty cab driver. But we've al always tried ourselves, being a little tipsy, sitting in the car and wanting to have a conversation with the cab driver, and then he's just angry. <laughs> have the right relationship and adapt. Be something actual humans can relate to. Given the choice between a faceless monolith and an organization that communicates directly and simply, customers will always choose the latter. It is not just okay for your organization to have personality, it is vital. Um, we did that in our early days, I remember in Sendes, like we added spelling mistakes to all our automated emails, simply to get a little 
uh, simply to get a little personality, have something that our customers could relate to as we were not just a marketing machine, but we were actual people behind the marketing machine. One of the things that worked really well for us back then too was that we, whenever we went to a city, we arranged a meetup slash drink up, which was basically just us reserving a bar somewhere, paying the tab, and allowing people to come and just hang out with us and other customers. You know, we were just still free guy in uh, some room somewhere in cold Copenhagen, but this gave us an ability to meet people, meet our customers face to face, so they knew that we were not just this fantastic, well-designed website, but also these guys that they could actually relate to. So, in your organization, in your customer service rep, make sure that they are something that actual humans can relate to. Be transparent. Um, people relate to organizations that are honest, that are open. Uh, give your customer the information that you have. We are fighting against years of people uh, feeling like companies are somehow screwing them over. So establish that trust, be transparent, share what you have with your customers. I, I'm, I'm going to mention a feature in Sendesk. We have this call center feature in Sendesk where we can provision you with a phone number and then you can take in calls and you can route them out to your employees and you have all this logic for managing a call center. One of the things that we do is that we, of course, we record the conversations. And you all tried this, you call a call center and like you hear that this conversation may be recorded for something, something purposes. We do the same thing, but that recording, we also save that for the customer. So they can always go back and listen to what did we actually agree on? What did we actually say? And there's a transcription of it and everything. This is just like, if they have the recording, why only provide it for the organization? Why not provide it for the customer too? And in general, the best way to test your ability to be transparent is to lie to your husband or your wife. You all know that will never work out. All right. <laughs> Empower your people to do what's best. Um, and this is actually really, really hard. We have been training customer service reps to act like machines. Fake smiles, scripts, compulsory, you know, have a nice day. This call is extremely important for us. Um, little mistakes, inefficiencies will occur when you empower to your, your team, your organization to do what's best, but that's actually healthy. But it's one of these things that we as business owners find it really, really hard. Like it's one of these things where empower your organization to do what's best in every interaction with the customer. We fear the loss of control. We fear that we cannot, um, that we cannot uh, control the conversation. We cannot control the message. And we fear all these little mistakes that will happen. Nevertheless, this is what customers want. And finally, put a face to your customers. Um, again, Today, with growth hacking, all these different things, it's so easy to forget about the actual people behind the numbers. We can all talk about, oh, we had a 96% satisfaction rating last month, but what does that actually mean? We had an NPS score of 40, great, but what does that actually mean? That means that some people are happy, but there's a lot of people who are also unhappy. They're not happy with your service. They're not satisfied with the product. And it's sometimes it's just very easy to forget about these people and that they are real people. Putting a face on these customers, sharing that in your organization, elevating that information in your organization. I know that Amazon was one of these companies that did that always on board level. Alongside, they had all the customer service metrics. They also put anecdotes. Real people with real problems, real issues with the organization, because it's such such transformational uh, to for your organization to suddenly realize that these people that had these issues are people that could just as well be somebody from school, from the local soccer club, from uh, another company you, that you know. It's like it's real people with real issues. So put a face to these customers uh, is so can be so transformational. Share the details inside the organization. I know that's one of these things that we do ourselves in our organization. We use Yammer as kind of our intranet, and every time we have a bad satisfaction rating 
in our customer service, we, f we escalate that ticket with all the information about the person to that Yammer thread so everybody can see what's going on. And it's incredibly transformational to suddenly have that information and put a real face on these customers. All righty, this was uh, seven tips for building great relationships. You can use them in your business. You can use them um, at home too. All righty, that was basically what I have for you today. I know you've been here for a couple of hours now, so have a, a great rest of the conference and see you out there in the halls.